Hello and welcome. My name is Jenna Cockworth, Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Washington University. I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar featuring Kevin Kiley, 2007 Olin MBA graduate. Now, before we begin, I'd like to explain the format for today's session. You will only hear and see me and our presenters. The webinar will last about 45 minutes. Following the webinar, we will have plenty of time for questions, and we encourage you to participate by asking questions through the Q&A option. To do that, type a question in the Q&A box at any time during the talk. Thank you to everyone who has already submitted questions through your registration. During the Q&A session, we will get to as many questions as we can. The webinar is being recorded, and we will share it on the Alumni Association YouTube channel and on our website following the event. It is on my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Amy Heath Carpentier. Amy co-founded the Pre-Graduate School Advising Program at WashU in 2006 and has been honored to co-direct it since. In addition, she is a career strategist for budding policy wonks, diplomats, and change agents at the Career Center and a lecturer in international and area studies. She is looking forward to the first session of her course, Gender Analysis for International Affairs, in just a couple of hours. Please join me in welcoming Amy. Thank you, Jenna. Lovely to see you all here today and a special welcome to all of our alumni. I'm happy to introduce Kevin Kiley, who will be leading this webinar today. Kevin is a 2007 MBA graduate from the Olin Business School, and for more than 10 years, he has coached early and mid-career professionals, career switchers, high potential leaders, medical doctors, and graduate and undergraduate students. He holds certifications for career leadership coaching, and his work has also spanned leadership communication, presentation skills, professional presence, team building, and conflict management. Kevin's background includes more than five years of leadership experience in corporate talent development and more than five years recruiting and evaluating talent for MBA programs at Washington University in St. Louis. In these roles as an independent coach and as the hiring manager for over 100 professional positions, he has reviewed thousands of candidate applications. Additionally, Kevin is a nationally award-winning communicator. His eight plus years of experience as a professional editor is highly leveraged in reviewing client resumes, LinkedIn pro profiles, cover letters, and other communication. He is a certified coach, professional coach, through the International Coaching Federation, and is a certified career coach and also an admissions consultant for graduate applications. We're excited to have Kevin join us today for a very timely and important topic about applying to graduate school, maximizing your chances at admissions. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Amy. I appreciate that warm introduction. And Jenna, thank you very much as well. It's a real thrill to be uh, back with uh, all my uh, WashU family. I spent uh, 11 and a half years or so total around Washington University, including uh, picking up my MBA there, as mentioned earlier. And so it's always a thrill to be back uh, with the good people at Washington University. Thank you so much for joining uh, today. Uh, I was very fortunate to have that warm introduction and you've learned a little bit about me. Now I'd like to learn a little bit about you all. So uh, we're gonna have a couple polls here to find out who's in the audience today and what you're thinking about relative to graduate school. So here's our first one. Just wanna know what area of grad school you're most likely to pursue. Um, you might be thinking about more than one of these areas and that's fine, but the question is, for right now, which of these is most likely to pursue? If you would kindly uh, enter that into the poll here and we'll get a sense of who's in our audience today. Thank you for bringing that up, Jenna. And whenever we have a critical mass, we'll see what we got. Okay, what we got here. Uh, okay, this looks like the <laughs> pretty much neck and neck. We have masters in some other area, including humanities, uh, science and engineering, and uh, wow, just over a third interested in a uh, doctoral or a doctorate, I should say. So that's awesome. That's really good. Uh, the next closest is uh, some sort of business masters uh, and a handful of other other things. Uh, for those uh, who indicated, I'm not sure at that at this point. That's fine. I appreciate you mentioning that, and uh, you know maybe with some additional research and introspection and that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, the answer to that sort of question will become more obvious uh, in the near term future. 
but thank you for everyone for joining us here today. But uh, good to know, good to know. Um, okay, let's think about our next poll here, and that would be the main reason for pursuing graduate study. Uh, and then we'll get into our uh, agenda and the actual content uh, for uh, the presentation here today. Uh, any one of these could be a good, very good reason for wanting to go to graduate school, and it's possible that you have several of these that apply to you. But the question is, is what is your main reason? What's the, if you had to identify the number one, what would that be? So thank you for bringing that poll up, Jennifer. Excuse me, Jenna. And we'll see what the tail of the tape is here once we get a critical mass. There's a lot of good reasons for doing this. And again, if you're not sure at this point, that is totally fine. But this is an important question. Why are you doing this? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Jenna. Now we have the results coming back here. And it looks like we have uh, the majority to qualify so for, for a new career path you've already chosen. So that with the indication there, uh, number three, is that you are in a certain career path right now and you want to quote and you need this additional credential, this additional degree to qualify yourself for something new. Uh, good. And uh, another uh, roughly third are saying to accelerate growth in the current career path. So you're in a certain area right now, you, you like what you're doing there, and you simply want to accelerate your growth in that particular area. Um, and then the 15%, I like it to say the further on learning and edification. That's great. That's really good. I mean, that's, you know, that's what uh, higher edge is all about. And uh, if, if, if there's a chance that it also uh, has a chance to um, fortify your professional career, all the better. So thank you for that. That is good to know. And I will keep that in mind as we go through our presentation here today. Uh, the warm introduction from Amy, uh, we've already heard a little bit about me and my background. Uh, the two organizations that I work with are uh, Career Roadmap, which is my own company uh, that I do uh, career coaching for. And then Grad School Roadmap. Grad School Roadmap is an admissions consultancy. I help people get into uh, graduate programs. And uh, the information on how to contact me on that will be at the very end. Uh, if you're interested in having me uh, work with you on grad school admissions, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and you'd be welcome to do that. But today we're here to talk about you and we're here to talk about how, uh, the, what the components of the application uh, are and how we can best uh, position you for success in the overall admissions area. So we'll talk about those components. We'll talk about how admissions committees use those components. Uh, to evaluate your candidacy. In other words, what they're looking for. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, admissions interview, and then I'll talk about nine specific things that you can be doing now, even if grad school is a ways away, even if you're not, for example, targeting admission for even January or fall 2021. Uh, there's things you can be doing now to improve your chances so that when you do apply, whenever that would be, you have the greatest possible chance of getting it. So, that's our agenda for today. And of course, as mentioned earlier, we do want to reserve time at the end for Q&A. Please use the Q&A box to submit those questions and we'll get to, get to as many of those as we possibly can. So that's one of the most enjoyable parts of these webinars uh, that I do for, for many, many institutions and for many companies is the Q&A because I want to know what's on your mind and how I can most specifically uh, help you relative to grad school. So that's our agenda for today. So first, let's talk about the components of an application. So something I'd want to point out immediately and is that really important to know, it would be literally impossible for me or for anyone else to detail out all the various nuances of every grad school application admissions process for every program everywhere in the world. There, and the, the point of that being is that there are nuances, there are differences, every program is unique. And so what we're doing here today is gonna to talk about a high level overview of these sorts of things. The good news is, is that for the majority of programs, these things are similar, if not identical, as far as the principles that you would wanna to follow to maximize your chances for admission but it is really important that as you go through this process that you are specifically checking into with each university, with each program, what their requirements are, what they're looking for, what information they put out there, because sure as you think you have this down for every program that you're applying for, there's gonna be that one that has just a, a, a different process, different set of requirements, and you wanna, the, the sooner you know that up front, the better off you'll be. Great example of this is financial aid, it's something that is important to so many of us, the question is, is, okay, if I'm interested in scholarships, grants, stipends, et cetera, you know, the good kind of money, the free money, um, or even loans, 
what is the process for, the, what do I have to do to be eligible for those, to be considered for those, et cetera. In your research, if you haven't already come to this, you will find that there is a vast array of different policies and procedures when it comes to this. Some programs will consider you for, let's just say a scholarship, they'll consider you for a scholarship just by the virtue of your application. There is no separate application or anything else that you have to do. You, once you apply, you're automatically considered for uh, scholarship money. Then some will have a separate scholarship application that will be part of, will be, it'll be part of, but it'll be separate from the main application. What I mean by that is it's a separate application, but they, they're both due at the same time. They both have the same deadline. So there is a separate application that you'd have to complete and submit. Still others, will have a, a scholarship application that will be uh, done after you would be admitted to the program. So you, once you would be admitted, congratulations, you're in. Now if you want some scholarship money, here's this other mini application that you're gonna have to do for that. You wanna know that up front because especially for that middle one, if you uh, submit your application, uh, you know, 15 minutes before the deadline, as so many applicants do, uh, you know, you've, you're, you're all happy. Okay, I got my application in. I hit the deadline, and now I can relax for a little bit. And the the application system says, "Thank you for submitting your application." And oh, by the way, have you done your financial aid application? And you didn't know that was coming. It's not a good moment because if that thing is due also in 15 minutes, you're not going to have time to do it. So know this stuff up front and just recognize that every program is going to be unique. So that said, let's talk about components of a grad school application. So first of all, they're going to want to know about transcripts. You're going to know about your past academic track record. I put undergrad transcripts here, but this would also apply to graduate transcripts. If by chance we're talking about your second or third graduate degree, as some people will pursue, uh, especially for those of you thinking about a, doc a doctor. Uh, it's possible that you already have a master's degree. They would want to see your master's uh, transcript transcripts as well. And they want to know not just the, uh, the GPA on it, but also the quality of institution. We'll talk a little bit more in a minute here about how they use those transcripts relative to the admissions decision. But you need to know that you need to uh, request those transcripts uh, from past academic institutions. Number two is standardized test, and I said maybe here, because this is a, uh, uh, I guess the best way I can put it is it's a moving target in higher education right now. You may be aware that there is a lot of pushback and a lot of discussion right now about standardized tests and the future of standardized tests. One of the things that sort of drove this, one of many things that drove us to the forefront uh, was, is quite frankly, the pandemic and the fact that late um, in the admission cycle for, 20, for fall 2020 admission, this past spring, uh, because of all of a sudden some people who were planning on taking a standardized test, whether it was GRE or LSAT or whatever it was, um, all of a sudden now they weren't able to take it anymore because testing centers were closing and they were shutting down. They were, you know, you couldn't go there. And many programs just frankly decided to either relax those um, policies or waive them. And uh, we're seeing some of that, that carry over to the current admission cycle too. There's also a lot of discussion about the overall merit of standardized tests. So for right now, just assume you're gonna, you know, especially for the top quality, the, the top tier programs, you are gonna need to take a standardized test. But keep your eye on that uh, because it could change. Uh, we're seeing some shifts in that area. Okay, uh, resume or CV, part of almost any graduate application. Uh, it could be a resume, it could be a CV. We could talk about the differences between the two, but the big, once again, check with every program and know what their requirements are and know what they're looking for uh, because there is a difference between those two things. Recommendations, uh, could be one, could be two, could be three, it just depends, once again, program specific. It could be uh, from, it could be, they might be asking for an academic rep recommendation or two, they could be asking for a professional one, could be a mix. Very rarely will it be a personal recommendation at the graduate level. Pro, uh, graduate level, sometimes it will, uh, but the recommendations uh, are almost certainly going to need to be part of your graduate applications. And then finally, uh, I'm sorry, not finally. Uh, second to last is essays, often called the personal statement. Uh, personal statement is what you would be doing for most of the doctoral applications. And there are essays uh, possibly as well. There is a big trend in admissions right now on the graduate side to having shorter uh, essays, shorter personal statements uh, in the order of you, you, instead of having, you know, two essays of, you know, 500 to 750 words, you'd have five, uh, what they call short answer questions. It's not really an essay, but in each one of those is 200 words or something like that. Again, it just depends. There are certain programs that uh, will have you do a video essay. They'll, your, your essay is actually a PowerPoint deck on yourself. 
they're, 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 they're getting creative. And so once again, you need to check with every program and do it early so that you can prepare for these things. Finally, uh, interviews, which we will talk about a little later in this presentation here today. Uh, they will be um, the, the majority of graduate programs you will need to interview as part of the application process. If not part of the application process, then almost certainly for any scholarship consideration or stipend, et cetera. So uh, those are the components of grad school application. Before we move to how admissions committees actually use these things to make their decisions, I have a poll question for you. All of these programs, uh, generally speaking, to, cons to, you know, to can be considered as hitting the deadline. It means 100% of those components are filed and are submitted to them by their application deadline. So those six things that I just talked about, what do you think are the ones, uh, or is the, is the one, I should say, that most frequently causes applicants to miss a deadline? of these things. And all these things can, of course, do that. But the question is, is what's your intuition about which one most frequently causes people to miss deadlines? If you would kindly register your votes. And when we have a critical mass here, Jenna will have the grand reveal of what we're thinking here. Again, all these things can delay, but there's there's one that it really does. <laughs> Boom, you nailed it. 62% uh, recommendations, uh, for sure. Recommendations are absolutely huge um, when it comes to uh, having people actually uh, miss a deadline. And the biggest thing is, is that you're counting on others. You're having uh, other people submit something on your behalf, and we're all busy, we all have other things going, and even though your applications are really, really important, and even though this person is close to you, they know you, they know how important it is, they have other competing interests. Uh, in my years as an MBA admissions director at WashU, I can tell you when we had recommendations, those were the things that most often would hold up someone being able to hit that deadline. Um, some programs might have, they might be a little more relaxed about this and you know, say, okay, well, we'll give you an extra couple of days or something. It just depends on the program. Uh, but the majority, if they've got a deadline, you know, this means that you have everything by that deadline. Uh, so the takeaway is uh, give yourself and give them plenty of time. Make sure that you are uh, being respectful of that and make sure that uh, you're setting yourself up for success. And uh, one of the biggest things is uh, missing that deadline. Because usually if you miss a deadline, um, it's not the end of the world, so to speak, but what it means is that usually your application usually will get clumped in with the next application deadline, which may be six weeks to two months to three months down the road, which usually means your admissions decision is also that much more delayed. You don't want this to happen to you. <laughs> you want to have everything in by that deadline. Uh, and you know, this is just something that's really important. So something to pay attention to. Okay, so we've gone over the uh, applica uh, application components, and so now let's move on to actually how uh, those things are used by admissions committees. The good news is, is that usually, again, we're speaking broadly here, usually there's not sort of one thing that they're looking at and everything else doesn't matter. They are usually, usually taking a broad approach. Uh, they look, look, you know, they, when they ask for certain things in your application, they ask for those for a reason because they want to see them and they do go into uh, you know, their evaluation of what it is. Some programs will communicate upfront exactly how much each component of your application is used to evaluate your candidacy. Others, it's much more, you know, sort of behind the cloak. And so, it, it, you know, it, it's one of those things when you evaluate program to program where you might apply, if they do communicate really specifically how they evaluate candidates and make their decisions, that could factor into your strategy around where you apply. Uh, for other places, you might have to, it might be a little bit more, you might be taking a, going on some faith that they will evaluate you in a positive way. Um, but the good news is, again, that there's not sort of like one thing that all these programs are looking at. They generally speaking are taking a, a holistic approach. So four things, uh, admissions committees, what they're looking for uh, from those applications. First of all, you know, hey, these are academic programs. This is no surprise. The question is, are you academically qualified? Are you going to be an academic liability if we bring you into this program? Do you, what evidence do we have that you will be successful academically in our program? What do they have to go on? Your past academic track record and your standardized test results. One or both of those need to be really competitive for that specific program. Uh, if, for, if by chance uh, past academic track record isn't so hot, uh, you can to a certain degree make up for that with the standardized test results. There are other things you can do. Um, 
that to sort of help compensate for that. And one of the good things too is that one of the reasons why admissions committees look for the whole transcript is because the GPA, the final you know numerical indicator of how well you were, how much you were, you were successful academically is important, but they also, I mean, they don't just need that number. They want to see semester by semester, the classes you took, the results that you had, and also they're going to look more specifically at ones that are closest related to that graduate program. So if you're looking at a graduate degree in chemistry, you know, of course, they're going to look at your science courses more closely. If you're looking for a master's degree in anything quantitative related, they're going to look at those things more closely. And so the GPA is important, but understand that there's a reason why they ask for those transcripts. They want to see all of that stuff. How well do you know their program? How much do you want to go there? These programs have one of the biggest difference between undergraduate and grad school is generally speaking, these pro graduate programs are smaller. There are fewer students uh, there and there are, they're, they're, they're tighter communities. And if you have someone uh, in that community who doesn't seem to be a good fit, doesn't really want to be there, uh, kind of is going there by default and for any other reason just isn't kind of going going along with everyone else and kind of see to be a good fit for that program, it will stick out. It'll be much more conspicuous than it would be on the undergraduate level. And so they want evidence that you want to be there and also evidence that if they admit you and you start that program, that you're going to finish that program. They really want you to finish that program too for a lot of different reasons. How do, I, how do they know that? That comes through in essays, interviews, and your uh, campus visits and other interactions. Uh, the whole notion of campus visits right now is kind of a, a peculiar notion because a lot of campus visits simply are not happening. So there are other ways that they you, you want to demonstrate that you are interested in those uh, particular programs. We can talk about that a little bit later. Career goals are you focused? Is the nature of that graduate program given your uh, combined, I should say, with your personality and your experience and your career goals, does that all make sense? Does it all, you know, where you are now and the experiences you have now and identifying what you want to be doing after that graduate degree and their graduate program bridging that gap. Does that whole, if you will, story, does that make sense? How do they know that? Resume or CV, your recommendations and your interview, and of course your personal statement or your essay as well. Articulating what it, your career goals are specifically, of course, in that. And finally, uh, with these four that almost every program are gonna be looking for, once again, are you a good fit for that culture? Are you the kind of person that they are gonna want to have around in their hallways on a daily basis? Are you the person that they're going to want to collaborate with? Uh, and that comes through from the sort of the interpersonal markings, those things such as the recommendations, the interview, any in-person or uh, virtual interactions that you have with them. Uh, again, they just want to know that you're a good fit uh, for that particular program. Here are some additional things that are specific for certain programs that you might consider. So, for example, if you're thinking about an MBA, it's no surprise that they're going to want to evaluate your likely success. What is your potential as a business leader? Uh, they would get that from your past uh, experience through your resume, essays, recommendations, interview. For many master's and doctoral programs, uh, they're going to know about your research interests. They're going to know about your teaching experience. That, of course, would be on your CV, be on your resume, and it could come through in essays and interviews as well. Uh, this obviously is a big, big deal when it comes to doctoral programs. Uh, and so that's one of those things that, uh, and I should say most doctoral programs. There are doctoral programs out there, um, but uh, depending on the nature of the program and what their points of emphasis are, that uh, you don't need as much research or teaching experience, and some you don't need any at all. It just depends on the program. Most do, but, you know, there are those that don't. So it just really depends. Finally, practical experiences, things like internships, job shadowing, networking, um, excuse me, volunteer work. Uh, they, nearly all programs are going to want to see this and some may actually be part of the requirement. So for example, if you have uh, your undergraduate degree and now you want to uh, become a physical therapist um, or an occupational therapist or um, a vet. Uh, there's a, by the way, veterinary school is insanely hard to get into. Anyway, they're going to want to see some practical experience, okay, along the way that shows that you are committed to this career path and that you are dedicated to it. And in fact, in many of those professions, like the ones I just mentioned, it will be a requirement as part of their application that you know that you have a certain number of contact hours in that area. Because again, they if they're going to give you, if they're going to grant you, if you will, one of those coveted seats in their program, they want to know that you, this isn't just something that you're thinking about doing, that you are firmly dedicated to this career path and you've actually spent time doing that, shadowing that, being in that environment, and you know this is this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. 
Okay, so uh, those are some of the things that admissions committees are looking for and specifically how they're going to uh, look for those certain kinds of things. Let's talk about the admissions interview. Uh, and I've broken this down into before, during, and after. Uh, and here's the deal. If I were to sum up this entire part of this presentation uh, in one word, it would be preparation. The person who is prepared the most for the interview is usually the one who's, who is most successful, okay? Uh, it, and it starts up front. As much as you possibly can, find out details about the interview itself, what the experience is going to be. Obviously, whether it's a, a phone interview online, in person, not many in-person interviews going on right now, but they are. There, there's a few of them going on out there. Uh, who is gonna be interviewing you and research that individual? And is there anything else that is gonna be part of the interview. Sometimes the interview is only part of the experience that they're going to have you do some sort of um, uh, case study, some sort of experiment. They're going to put you into a team and see how you work with others, all those sorts of things. So it's not necessarily just, you know, you and another person or a team of individuals, you know, Q&A sort of thing. It could be, could be more. So you want to know that up front. So hopefully you're not blindsided by it. Do your research, again, prepare. Make sure that you know that program backward, forward, and sideways, and also prepare your questions for them. Because almost at the end of every interview, just like a job interview, you should expect that they'll say, well, thank you very much. What questions do you have for me? You always want to make sure you have questions. They may very well use your resume or CV to sort of frame the interview. So you want to make sure that you're very familiar with that. It is the case sometimes that we apply and then we're not interviewing until four or six weeks later and we haven't looked at our CV or our resume in a while. You need to make sure that that is very top of mind. Uh, you can even have it in front of you, especially in a virtual environment or a phone. You know, you want to make sure that you have, you know, there's nothing wrong with having forgive the term a cheat sheet or two or have your resume in front of you um, but obviously it's very important that uh, you, you you speak and uh, speak to the other individual you're not reading something uh, so use those things but make sure that you're familiar with it and you have it top of mind as well uh, attire very important make sure if you don't if you're not sure you, know, you need to do what to wear it's always best to overdress than to underdress uh, and obviously in the area of era of virtual seemingly everything so many interviews are being done uh, through a video and so uh, everything that you would do for a video uh, the, my, my best takeaway on this is that if you have a really important meeting whether it's a job meeting or someone you're you're trying to network with or something along those lines a really important one, that's how you should treat an admissions interview relative to how you dress the setting how quiet it is uh, and make sure that you are all on the up and up with your technology do not find out five minutes before your interview that your audio isn't working or you know your, your webcam suddenly you know isn't working or whatever it might be you don't practice up front just because you've been doing everything by zoom lately uh you know they they might want to do the practice interview by skype and you know well guess what skype has a whole different set of preferences and you know you, it might screw something up so make the technology a total non-issue uh for is relative to the interview uh, there's no one right way to ace the interview, but at the same time, keep in mind that they can pretty much ask you any question under the sky, uh, other than, you know, illegal, there are certain illegal questions, of course, but they can pretty much ask you anything. And so understand that, yes, preparation is a huge component of success in the interview, but you also need to go into that experience ready to think on your feet, ready to be nimble, and just understand that, hey, they could pretty much ask you anything, so just be ready for that. So talking about the evaluation process, which is all part of what the interview is, let's talk about that. So the evaluation, this is a true or false, the evaluation of your candidacy in the context of the admissions interview begins when they ask you their first question. You know that you're being, in other words, you know that you're being evaluated when they ask you that first question. Um, and this is true, by the way, if it's, uh, if it is relative, if, it, if the format is in-person video or phone, true or false? Thank you, Jenna. By the way, as we're doing these polls, I hope you're also submitting questions into the Q&A box and take a moment to do that. We're um, progressing fairly quickly through this so that we have uh, adequate time for questions at the end. So please don't forget to do uh, to submit those questions uh, in the Q&A box as well. And let's see what we got here. Well, let's see, 40-60 split or so, this 40%. I'm sorry, 60% said false, and uh, yeah, th that, th this, is, this is false. So your evaluation begins the, the moment that you basically are on site. Uh, 
Uh, you, once you're there, whether that's physically there or on the call or on the video, you, you can assume that you are being evaluated. Uh, it, it does not begin with that first question. There are tons of questions, I'm sorry, tons of stories that are out there about individuals who assume that uh, they, they, you know, once they were on campus, they could kind of do whatever they wanted and they only had to sort of be on their best professional behavior when it came to the interview. And uh, something got back to the admissions committee, uh, something as simple as being rude to the, you know, the coffee shop attendant across the hallway or to the parking lot person or anybody else. And um, it caused them to be denied from, from, that, from that particular program. So uh, once you're on, and, and you know, obviously it's the right thing to do, be professional, be courteous, be polite, uh, because you, and you know, it's the right thing to do, but also you are being evaluated from the moment you are sort of in the presence of that program, whether again, it's on, on site or uh, on a, in a virtual capacity. Um, once, if you are on site, uh, obviously the class of duck into a restroom, make sure that uh, everything's looking good and you're good to go and ready to be there. Uh, don't be empty handed, have something ready to go. Turn off that phone, whether it's a virtual interview, in person or whatever, uh, pretty much nothing good can happen by having your phone on uh, in the middle of an interview. I've had it happen personally when I'm interviewing someone when I was, you know, it's just me in my office and this gentleman, we're, you know, going over, uh, you know, MBA stuff right there in Simon Hall, right at, uh, right on campus and right in the middle of, I don't know, our interviews, some, some big sports news broke. And all of his friends were texting him and his phone for about 10 minutes just was boom, it was buzzing. And it was a huge distraction. And you know, even if you have it on silent, it's just a bet, turn it off, off before you go into the interview. Being there five minutes beforehand, I say exactly five minutes and here's why that's important. Being there early, generally speaking, even if it's virtual, will alert the other person that you're, you're in the meeting, you're in the online meeting. And oftentimes it can feel sort of like an obligation, like, okay, they're there early and it can create sort of this dynamic where they feel like they need to be early too. Um, and so five minutes early is a real good time to, to, to get in, not earlier, not later. The other thing five minutes uh, allows you to do is if by chance there is a technical glitch, it gives you a little bit of time to, to fix that. But again, hopefully you've done your work up front and the chances of that are minimal to none. Uh, so again, five minutes beforehand is a real good sort of uh, uh, target to, to go for. During a strong first impression, this is a pet peeve of mine, first and last name. Uh, when you're introducing yourself socially, uh, you know, that's you, you, it, however you want to do it, that's fine. As a professional, for an interview, whether it's a job interview, for an admissions interview, first and last name. And good strong eye contact, good firm handshake if it's in person. Uh, be gracious, uh, thank them for the interview, thank for their time. Be prepared for that small talk. It is the case that people often make an impression of you and your candidacy early, even, even perhaps before they even ask that first question. And so if you're on the video call with that person and they say, well, good morning, uh, Sally, how are you doing today? Good, good, okay, how's your day going so far? Fine and nothing else, you're, you, no, you need to engage. You need to have, have some things to say. You know, be prepared for that preliminary small talk. It's, it's part of our standard communication and the goal is to make this as conversation as possible. And you're also, you want to create a strong impression and present your case for admission, of course, but you also want to come across as a human being and someone who, again, who they would want to have in their program. Don't make them have to sort of extract information out of you. Conversely, it's not your goal to take over the interview with your own agenda. Let them run the interview and let them ask the questions. Uh, again, you want to make it conversational. Uh, your questions, uh, I'm sorry, your responses to question, generally speaking, somewhere between 30 seconds and two minutes. Uh, and, and just again, make your, make your personality you want to come through. There's, you know, you, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people end up making, uh, especially in the interview setting, often too in the essays or personal statement, is they feel like they have to come across as someone that they're not. And they, in other words, they're not themselves be yourself. That is what programs want. They want to know who the genuine person is. They, they're, they're looking to admit human beings, not robots. Come across as yourself. That having been said, you do need to get comfortable making a case for why you should be admitted to that program, and you have to be comfortable promoting your accomplishments. This is just like a job interview. I know that this is uh, an uncomfortable thing for many people, promoting their own accomplishments. Uh, it, it seems like you're sort of arrogant or braggadocious, this sort of thing. Um, but I can tell you that in a, just like a job setting, just like a job interview, this is one of those settings 
where if you don't and your competition does, you could find yourself um, not getting in. It's just that simple. You have to get comfortable promoting your accomplishments and uh, telling them uh, specifically why you're qualified there. Always, like I mentioned earlier, always have questions for them. Really important. Uh, and by the way, you don't necessarily have to wait until the end of the interview to ask your questions. Again, you're not taking over the interview, but you do want to, you know, hey, uh, while we're on this topic, do you mind if I ask a question? Make sure that you're asking good questions. And a good question is one that the answer is not commonly found anywhere else for, on there, for example, their admissions materials or some other communication that they have put out there. Make sure that you're asking good questions that show your genuine interest in the program, show that you've done your research, and that you truly want to be there. Those are good questions. But of course, be mindful of the time as well. If the interview is designed to go 30 minutes and they don't ask you for your questions until 28 minutes into it, you may not have time for but one question. It just, it's one of those things you have to kind of have a sense of where we are on the timing. Afterwards, it's kind of the reverse of the first part. Again, thank them for their time. Good, firm handshake if you're there in person, eye contact. Uh, remember that you're still being evaluated uh, all the way through the time you, you leave. Uh, I heard a story the other day about someone who was interviewed <laughs> in a Zoom setting and um, they, I just put it this way, they thought that they thought they were off the Zoom call. They thought that the other person was gone. And um, as, this, as, this, as my friend told me, this, uh, the person said something that they shouldn't have said and the other person was still on the line is the, is the short version of it. And uh, I don't think it's going to help their candidacy. So make sure that you are fully off, fully away, fully done before you heave that sigh of relief or say anything, quite frankly. Um, do a brain dump. Make sure that you're keeping all your information straight. Uh, a huge principle overall in the application process, by the way. Make sure that you're keeping things straight because if you're applying to multiple programs, you're trying to keep all this data and information and deadlines and everything straight and who's who, uh, have some way to stay organized. Um, and then uh, thank you, uh, thank you notes. Uh, today, these days, when very few people are actually on campus or their schedules are kind of all over the place, um, make sure that you, uh, I would tell you that don't even think about, don't even worry about a handwritten thing, just send email. That's just, it's the safest way to go. It does not need to be anything long, drawn out, flowery or anything like that. It can be fairly short and sweet. Thank them for their time. Make sure that they, make sure that they know that you appreciate them and they appreciate their time and that, you know, you can point out a thing or two that you discussed or whatever, um, but a short and sweet email usually will get the job done uh, overall. Okay, uh, we're, we're starting to run a little short on time here, so I'm going to move this last section fairly quickly so we can get to our Q&A, but I do want to go over these nine things that you can be doing now to maximize your chances. The first thing is take that standardized test. Again, I don't see that, broadly speaking, going anywhere anytime soon, and the sooner you can get that knocked out and you kind of know your score and kind of know where you stand, uh, the better. Uh, almost every, well, every standardized test you can take multiple times, so it's not a one-time shot. The other thing to know is this, is that the, 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 your, a score is going to be applicable for five years. And so even if you're not thinking about you know, grad school for a little bit down the road, uh, there is some merit to considering taking the uh, whatever the standardized test is now, especially if now is you're much closer to your undergraduate experience, or even still in undergrad, because you're kind of still in sort of a student mode, you're still in sort of a test taking kind of mode, um, and just know that your stand that, that score will be applicable for some time uh, to come. So the, the, you give yourself a huge advantage if you can get that thing knocked out, uh, do well on it, and then if you don't do as well as you want, you now you actually have time to consider taking. It, uh, an additional time and usually when people take it an additional time usually they do at least slightly better not always but usually they do I lump these next three kind of all together because they kind of go together excelling in your current professional role uh, this will be something that will be important to it because once again as part of every application you're gonna have to submit a resume or a CV and uh, admissions committees are going to want to see, generally speaking, a track record of success in their professional roles. Even if you're still an undergraduate, it's sort of like, what kinds of things are you engaged in right now? What are your leadership experiences? Uh, how do we know that you're gonna be a good uh, contributing uh, member of our community if we were to admit you here? Um, build that resume up and your career path. Make sure that you are taking on not just academic things, but also uh, things that can build your resume as well and sort of complete sort of that Total, total case for your admission, whether again that's volunteer work, hands-on opportunities, internship, externship, anything like that. Um, but be careful too that as you're sort of trying to round out your resume or your CV, uh, job hopping is generally not seen as a good thing. It's understandable that people change jobs now usually far more often than they did in the past. 
uh, but there is a fine line there about changing jobs too frequently. It starts to not look good. Um, and then of course, making sure that you're continuously working to define and refine your career path because the biggest thing is you wanna know, you wanna be able to make the case to admissions committee why you are doing this, why you want to pursue this particular graduate degree and having that all fit into your career plans and having a really good idea of what that career plan is obviously is gonna be foundational to being able to do that. Okay, recommenders, coming down the home stretch here. Recommenders, if, if, you're, if you haven't been in touch with someone you think who might be a recommender in, in several years, probably time to reach out to that person. Uh, you know, again, it's for, especially for a lot of these programs that we have so many people uh, on the uh, webinar here today who are thinking about a doctorate, uh, you know, academic references and recommenders are gonna be really important. And if you haven't been in touch with those people, now, now would be the time to do it. When you do that, um, you know, reach out to them, remind them of who you are. They probably work with a lot of different students. Maybe they know who you are immediately, maybe they don't, um, but you can. It is possible to reestablish a relationship with someone. You might have to sort of qualify it and tell them about, remind them of a certain paper that you wrote for them or a project or something along those lines. But, um, you know, start cultivating them now because, you know, the, the right time to do it is as well in advance as possible not you know two weeks before the deadline and they haven't heard from you in 10 years and now you want them to write a rec, a rec, rec letter for you not the time to do it so get on that now uh, the network part of it is too good too because for most individuals if you're going into a graduate program on the other on the other end you're going to need that network as part of your job search and uh, so make sure that you're doing things there so again, nothing that says you can't start your program research now. If you're thinking about applying for uh, fall of 2021, I sure hope you've already done a lot of this, but there are a lot of decision points uh, about what kinds of programs might be a good target for you, not just the nature of the program itself, but which ones best align with your career goals. Are you gonna do it full-time, part-time, part -time, some sort of hybrid thing, um, you know, and then the, the, the scholarship question, this is something I always ask. This is a rhetorical question. Let's just say that you apply to seven different programs, which is, you know, fairly typical depending on what you're going for, but let's just say seven. And you get admitted to your number one, and it's a rank order. You get admitted to your number one school, and you get admitted to your number seven school. Your number seven school gives you a full tuition scholarship. You're not paying anything. Awesome, right? Your number one school gives you nothing, but you're admitted. Which one do you go to? I don't know. And that's, again, that's the kind of thing you want to be thinking through as far as how important is that, because that also can play into your overall admission strategy and where you apply. Attending uh, events, again, it shows the, the demonstrated interest. It shows, you know, what you're interested in, what, you know, how that you really want to go there. Obviously, on campus, things are few and far between now, so virtual events. There are ways you can demonstrate interest in these programs, even though, in some cases, campus visits are limited or to, to non-existent. Getting on their mailing lists now, uh, I recognize that if you get on a school's uh, email list that means you're going to be getting a lot of emails from them and sometimes that can be a little overwhelming when you've got you know 20 programs emailing you constantly but it's a really good way if just to keep the pulse on the program and to see what's going on and you never know when something that they put in front of you can be used either in an interview or an essay or who knows what so just kind of, you know you don't have to read everyone you know every one of them from start to finish but just kind of keep your finger on the pulse you can also follow programs on social media whether that's Facebook Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, take your pick, whatever you want to do. Um, but, you know, just plug into these programs and know kind of what's going on, a high level with what's going on there. It could come invaluable. And finally, I say mind your social media. Be careful with your own social media. It is increasingly the case that admissions committees are searching applicants out online and using what they find there as part of their evaluation process. They'll never formally probably admit to that, but they do. And more and more people are doing that. And that could be a simple Google search or they could go looking for you on social media. And so if, you know, just be careful about what you put there. Obviously it's a free country, you can say whatever you want, but there could be consequences to what you put up there. And just be mindful of that and making sure that you're, uh, you know, be yourself of course, but also just know that, you know, if it's out there, uh, you know, it could be fair game for that admissions committee. And in some cases it actually support, you know, what's your overall case for admission, in other cases, it may do the opposite. So there are nine things you can be doing now, even if grad school is a ways away. Uh, I hope that uh, some things on this list are beneficial, even if you only do one uh, or two of them for right now. Uh, these, these are all things you can be doing uh, right now. Okay, and that wraps up the formal part of the presentation. Thanks for hanging with me. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, and so what I wanna do is turn that back over to Amy now and let's, uh, let's see what, uh, what we've got. Amy, please. 
Thank you, Kevin. Um, we have a variety of questions. Some of the questions were really specific and difficult to answer in kind of more of a global way. And so I'd encourage people um, to follow up with some of the resources we'll send out later um, about really, really specific questions about programs. But to get started, one of the questions that came in time and time again is what do you do if your undergrad GPA was not the stellar GPA, it was under a 3.5, a 3.4, um, maybe you had to retake a course, you had a rocky semester, how do you make up for that in the application process and how should you approach that? Sure, that's a phenomenal question. Thank you, Benny. Um, so the, um, the biggest way you can under, the biggest way you can overcome a, uh, an undergraduate experience that you think is um, less than stellar is to, is, is to do well and be a standardized test. Because again, academically speaking, they're going to be looking for some evidence that you are going to be able to make it in their program. And again, they're looking for one or both of those things, your past academic track record and your standardized test, one or both of those need to be really good. Now, there's nothing you can do about your past academic track record. Obviously, it's in the past. So in addition to the standardized test, which you also could do is look to take some courses um, at a local school, community college, whatever it might be, that can help uh, overcome some of the, that what you perceive to be some of the deficiencies. So for example, I mentioned quantitative things earlier. If you're looking to get and uh, do a master's in, um, I'm trying to think of something that would be, I guess I use an MBA. MBAs, there's a lot of quantitative stuff that goes into those programs. And so if you, uh, you know, if quantitative, if you if either don't have very much quantitative experience on your academic transcripts, or if what you do have, the grades are sort of so-so, and the other big thing is if it's been a while since you've been in school, uh, one way to come back on that is to go, you know, go take a pre-calc or a calc class or a cues or something like that uh, at a community college or an area college or something like that and use that hopefully strong grade to demonstrate to the admissions committee that first of all, that you're serious about this. And second of all, that much more recently here is, it's limited, but here's an example of my dedication to this. And here's how I am ready to apply myself for this particular graduate degree. Um, but again, the good news is, is that admissions committees are using everything on the application as part of their evaluation. But yes, the academic component of it is, is absolutely huge. Love that question. Thanks, Amy. Terrific. Thank you so much about that or for that. Um, and another group of questions came in really about the GRE given COVID. Um, you've already sort of touched on this, but you know, what to do when they say they're optional on the program's website? Um, what about the subject tests this year? And then when you're applying to an MBA or law school, when it will say the GMAT or the GRE or the LSAT or the GRE, how do you strategize? Okay, so generally, so a little history lesson, and that is, is that for years and years, most graduate programs, they had one standardized test that was possible. So for example, if you wanted a graduate, if you wanted a law, a law degree, you were going to take the LSAT, and that would end the story. It was just that that was the standardized test. If you were going to get a graduate degree in business, you would take the GMAT, and that was it, end of story. The GRE has made inroads into these other areas where, to the point now, where many, many, many law programs accept both the LSAT and the GRE. Um, the vast majority of graduate business programs accept both. So the question is, of course, is which one do I, do I take? Which one should it be? First and foremost, look at each program specifically and see if they express a difference, or I'm sorry, a preference, a preference for either one or the other. If they prefer, obviously, one strongly or the other, that should be a pretty strong indicator of that would be the one that you would want to take. That having been said, there are pretty big differences between, for example, the LSAT and the GRE. And if it is your belief that you would do a lot better on, let's just say, the GRE than you would the LSAT, then you would want to take the GRE. Because again, you're, you're, you're basically creating a strategy that helps you present the best possible case for admission. So even though a school perhaps might not uh, accept, um, or except they would prefer the LSAT, the GRE may be to your overall advantage. Another thing to weigh out too is that if, again, if most individuals are applying to, you know, somewhere between five and 10 different programs, some programs that you might apply to might have, might have no preference, but there might be a couple that have a strong preference. And, and unless you want to just, you just love taking standardized tests and want to take both, uh, you, you, you know, you'd want to <laughs> you know, pick one or the other. 
and then kind of go with it there. So uh, the biggest thing is, is just to know what those programs are um, and, and, and sorry, what their preferences are and to go with those. Um, that having been said, if, if you are a strong overall candidate, um, which standardized test you take is going to be important, but not that important. So in today's climate, usually speaking, if you have an option, it really is optional. Wonderful. I think that's really good news for a lot of people. Um, you know, yeah. especially those of us who have always questioned these, I have questioned these mm -hmm. exams, I should say. Um, so we have a couple of questions about the CV resume. Mm -hmm. The most important being, what would you put on unrelated experience? So if you have been doing something unrelated or you had your first job out of school was unrelated to what you want to go into next and you've done some things since, would you bother putting that on your CV or your resume? So big difference between the CV and the resume. So for the res so once again, here I go again, check with every program. So for some programs, uh, they will require a resume uh, and a one page resume and a story. Um, for a lot for doctoral programs, you're probably looking at a CV, which generally speaking uh, is, is much longer. And for uh, certain pockets of, of research and academia, it's almost like a competition to see who can have the longer CV. And it is more common to sort of put uh, sort of a more comprehensive set of experiences on there. So first and foremost, just make sure it, to, to, to respond to this question, make sure that, again, you're operating within the parameters that have been dictated by the specific program. Most that having been said, most programs, uh, regardless of what discipline they're in, are interested in individuals who are well rounded and who have, a, you know, an interesting set of overall comprehensive experiences. And so this is, for example, a big difference between uh, a resume that one might submit for a job in, uh, interview, where these days in that sphere, uh, once upon a time, we used to have, you know, other interests and stuff like that. And we talk about how we like to go, you know, rock climbing or cooking or whatever like that. Well, on a job, for job resumes, I would not recommend those on there. Uh, but however, but in certain graduate programs, again, it could depend on the nature of the program, that they're, they're, they are more interested in, again, sort of a person's well-roundedness. And so that, what I just expressed, would be a little bit more relaxed for a graduate program. At the end of the day, the question is, is with, if that experience isn't directly related, my suggestion would be to, you can include it, if assuming you have room to include it. If you have a requirement from a program that wants a one-page resume, and everything else on there is just much more related and you know much more directly applicable to that particular program, then you're probably gonna be leaving that off. Um, but you know, if it's a longer CV uh, where you do have the room to put that stuff on there, then you would include it. Great, so there is another question, you know, one of the, the real struggles I think for alumni, and I've been in this boat, so I, I can understand it, is how do you contact your professors when you haven't maybe kept up those communications, you know? And um, I advise on this a lot, like how do I make that contact again? Yeah. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Kevin. My, my well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, Amy, but my, my, partic my own particular thing is, is that, you know, if, if you're looking for someone, you know, to, it usually it's for a recommendation or, you know, you might be calling them for, you know, advice on certain programs or whatever it is you know, they're, you're going to have to reach out to them some point. So whether, you know, and you know them and their personality, whether it's a phone call or an email or, you know, a, a note on LinkedIn or however, you know, however it might be. And again, I, I think the biggest thing is, is just, especially if it's been a while, you know, you can simply acknowledge that. I mean, you know, you can say, hey, you know, I haven't kept up with that person. Well, they haven't kept up with you either. But, you know, hey, let's just let me reach out and let me just, you know, see how it goes and remind them of who you are, remind them of what courses you did together or what practical experiences they supervised or projects or they were the advisor to this, ex this you know, co-curricular activity or whatever it might be, just remind them of that and just kind of catch them up on who you are and where you are now, um, offer to be in touch with them, should we set up a phone call, this is what it is. I, I encourage transparency of what it is. And the, there's basically one of two things will happen usually. One, either they'll, you know, you, you won't hear from them and okay, well then unfortunately that's unfortunate and you move on, you never know. You know, what, what could be going on? They could be busy. They could be emeritus now and they hardly ever check email. There's a lot of different things there. Or they, they could hear, you could hear back from them. And then you kind of continue the conversation there. Again, I think one of the biggest things, if you put yourself in their shoes, they're busy people too. 
And the earlier you can get to them and the, you know, and to give them as much runway as you possibly can so that they can prepare those recommendations for you, um, you know, you're much more likely to, uh, I think, achieve success in this area if you give them plenty of time and give them the tools that they need to succeed to give you a strong recommendation. What would be your advice, Amy? I, I agree with everything you said there. I think that there's often a perception that um, we don't re rem remember. Um, <laughs> and the reality is we may not remember the date you graduated or mm -hmm. the date, you know, exactly what that paper, the argument in your paper was that we gave an A on, but we will remember you. And so, you know, give us the goodwill of trying. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it is considered a uh, part of our jobs to write recommendations and it is considered but but that doesn't mean that we're obligated if i feel like we are obligated to tell you no if we don't feel like we know you well enough or can write you a strong letter um, for one way or the other the best way to do deal with that and there's a, a handout on the pre-graduate school advising website for washu on this that we developed with washu faculty so anyone who is struggling with this question might want to go and find that um, and I can make that available to Jenna to send out but basically to be able to get to a position where you feel like you can ask them do you know me well enough to write me a strong letter and in this case do you have enough time um, yeah but just remember not to take it personally we are really really busy <laughs> just like you are so you know but we probably remember you and the more data you can give us Mm -hmm. um, old papers we marked up, the better off you'll be. Great, great stuff. Yeah. And there's, yeah. there's yeah. position, position those recommenders for success. Absolutely. Exactly. One last question we're getting, and, um, I want to make sure we try to get to is, you know, during COVID time, it is really hard to figure out, uh, the, the sort of nature of a program. Like yeah. what is the real deal about this program? How do I get to know the culture of it? Do you have any mm -hmm. advice for us on that? I, it's, uh, to me, that's all about the people in the program. I, I think that, you know, the, the <laughs> having been around WashU for quite a while, you, I'm, I'm guessing you might uh, see it similarly. Sometimes the, the culture of a program or the personality of a program is directly influenced in, to a nth degree by the, by the people in that program. Who is in charge of the program? Who are the faculty? Who are the students? And that sort of thing. I would suggest strongly that you have as many conversations as you possibly can with individuals in that program. Uh, and by the way, most programs, this is sort of a, an admissions insider thing, most admissions uh, committees and most admissions folks, to a certain degree, they will make available certain current students uh, where, you know, if you're interested, you know, if you're interested in a certain area of, bit, um, of a, a graduate study or something along these lines, they can connect you with a current PhD student or a current master's student or that sort of thing. Um, the majority, here's the insider thing. Most of the time, the admissions offices are going to make available people who, basically their best people. And so I would encourage you to use things like social media, particularly LinkedIn, and seek out some individuals who aren't on the admissions website and send them a friendly note. Again, the worst thing you can do is you don't hear back from them. As Amy said, don't take it personally and move on. But try to talk to as many people as possible. And a really good question to ask is quite simply, is if you had to do it all over again, would you select this particular program at this particular institution? And if not, that's something pretty telling right there. Uh, so again, absence of being able to actually be on campus, be within those halls, and actually literally ensconce yourself within the, at that program, it's all about conversations and talking to as many people as you possibly can. And by the way, that could include alums too. Thank you so much, Kevin, and you're right. That trick about using LinkedIn, going to the school's website, hitting alumni, sorting by program is very powerful. Um, totally. You can totally reach out to people. So yeah. I wanna thank you, and I know we have hit our last question there, and I'm gonna transition over to Jenna. Yeah, Kevin and Amy, thank you so much for participating in today's event. We look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Be sure to mark your calendars for November 17th for the upcoming webinar featuring Kevin Kiley's Smart Approaches to Launching Your Job Search. 
So additionally, we encourage you to visit the digital resources and virtual connections page on our website to learn more about ways to connect with WashU alumni, students, and faculty. So thank you guys again for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Kevin.